الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم لك الحمد على ما انعمت به علينا من تنزيل القران اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين we begin by thanking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent down the book upon the heart of his chosen prophet alayhi salatu was salam a book that removed the darkness of kufr and forever brought light to the heart of the believers we had stopped in our previous class discussing beauty husn and i realized that uh, in the previous class when we went into the details of the seven terms used in the quran for beauty uh, it became very difficult for many to follow so i have been thinking about how to make it how to go into the concept of beauty in the quran without having to focus on the the words used in the quran and it's impossible to do that because ultimately we are dealing with a text that is in a language it has words so unless we associate with these words unless we make those words our own words unless we dip deep into the meanings of those words there is no other way to dip into the ocean of what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed so our difficulty is in terms of the depth of the grammatical discussions that are in our sources and they're just so fascinating but they are fascinating for a um, for an audience for people who are really uh, interested in in the language itself we are interested generally speaking in concepts but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conveys to us so that we can benefit from those concepts so i'm going to do a little bit of uh, inshallah lightning of the of the thing but to uh, begin do you remember how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes beauty in the quran uh, using seven words primarily and then there were two we said they are connected with the concept of beauty but in an indirect way the most obvious is husn I'm going to go very slowly inshallah the second most obvious is jamal most people know jamal uh, from other languages as well so husn jamal they are both used and then zina zina is also very common in many islamic languages and nadra is not so common and bahja is not so common and hilya is not so common these three are not so common and the two indirect references to beauty are kareem and yahbarun so today inshallah what the plan is to review some of the concepts that we discussed last time it's been long time two weeks and then come back to one particular aspect of beauty which is not mentioned in the quran but which is so essential for a thematic understanding of the concept of beauty in the Quran because it deals with the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we all know the hadith very well right allah is beautiful and loves beauty inshallah we we we'll, we we'll focus on just this part today first of all we did this many weeks ago in another reference about what is beauty remember maybe some do you remember you were there in the, in the initial classes is the beauty the concept of beauty so how do we define beauty 
many, many weeks ago, in another reference, this came, the definition of beauty itself. And we said that uh, unless we have a clear understanding of what is the meaning of beauty, we cannot proceed. Al-Husn, who were kawnu shay malayman li taba kal fara, wa kawnu shay sifat al kamal kal ilm, wa kawnu shay mutaallak al mada kal ibadat. This is uh, uh, Al Jurjani. He died in 816. And when we did this session on uh, definitions, I underscored the fact that our scholars were extremely interested in defining things properly. And one of the problems that we have in our, our world, contemporary world, is that the definitions have either become confused for people or they have become obscure in the sense of lack of clarity that we have everywhere. We don't even know what words mean anymore. Why were they so interested in precisely defining terminology? Because everything that we understand about a thing depends on how clearly we have understood. So when it comes to beauty, what do we know? How do we understand beauty? Can anyone define beauty in any language, not just in this? Beauty is something which pleases you or it gives you sakina. So beauty is something that pleases you and that gives you sakina. That's one definition and which is very close to how uh, Al-Jurjani actually, the first of the three things that he said, Malayman li This is something that is harmonious. It is something that is uh, in accordance to our natural disposition. Malayman li like happiness. So happiness itself is beauty because it produces a sense of relief in our beings. So the first aspect of beauty is uh, what pleases us. What pleases us is beautiful. Now, because what pleases you may be different from what pleases him or me, does that mean that your concept of beauty is different from his concept of beauty? That your, this definition raises a question. We inshallah go into that. Second, al Jujani said, Sifat al-Kamal. Al-Husn is perfection, perfection. And Ihsan in our, you know, in Hadith Jibreel is perfection, is excellence. So we have the uh, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, three levels as in the Hadith Jibreel, Jibreel al Islam came and he taught Prophet three aspects of our deen, and Ihsan was the highest, which was you, you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see him. And if you cannot see him, then at least know that he is seeing you. This is the highest level in Ibadat. Sifat al-Kamal is the attribute of perfection. Al-Asma al-Husna, we say, Allah has, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the most beautiful names. Al-Asma al-Husna. Al-Husna is the most beautiful. Now, what is the definition of perfection? But can be, I mean, there, there could be several aspects of perfection, but Al Jujani says, like knowledge. Because knowledge makes things perfect in the sense of our ability to understand them. Al ilm as opposed to al jahl, as opposed to ignorance. Third, al madah, kal ibadat. Look at this third aspect of beauty, which is the acts of worship. The acts of worship are defined as al-husn, and in fact, one of the names in the Quran of uh, Jannah, of paradise, is al-husna. Al-husna is the name of Jannah. Because it's perfect, because it pleases, it has everything that we can think of beauty is in it. Al-Husna is the play. 
uh, Raghi, we said this before, we always, I, we just love to go back to Raghi Vlaswani because of the conceptual clarity Allah SWT gave him. And he says that uh, uh, there are three aspects of beauty, al husn And again, your definition is, uh, what you said is perfect because everyone is going back to Ibarah an kulli mabhaj marhubin fi. Any, everything that pleases us, he says, marhub is something that is attractive, something that we really love to have. But he defines further three, uh, three aspects of what pleases us. What can please human being could be mustahsan min jahd al-aql. It pleases us at the level of intellect. Second, mustasan min jahd al-hawa. It pleases us because we desire it. Number three, mustasan min jahd al-his. It is pleasing to our senses. And I gave the example of uh, fragrance of al-musk. Like musk, khitamuhu misk, fali. The, the seal of the drink that will be given to the uh, dwellers of paradise uh, has, a, has a seal of musk on, musk on it. So it's the pleasing us. When we say minjahd al his, it means it's pleasing to our senses. It's beautiful to look at, it's beautiful to smell. It's beautiful to hear, like the, when we receive hear the recitation of the beautiful recitation of the Quran, it just takes us somewhere else because of the beauty of the sounds, which uh, pleases. Now, coming to the question, then, what? Of course, there is a there is a norm in every jizz, in every creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. There is a normal spectrum of qualities, meaning a normal human being who has not been distorted, a normal human being whose fitra has not been corrupted to the extent that he has lost or she has lost humanity to a certain extent, they would all have a common spectrum of what, how they define beauty, what pleases them. But because of the distortions, in our psyche, in our spiritual aspects, in our emotions, uh, in our upbringing, human beings can have different concepts of beauty at the level of individual. The distinction that we need to understand is that what pleases me and what pleases you is subjective as far as the observer is concerned, not the object of observance. Meaning, what is inherently beautiful, whether it is in aqaid, in amal, or in the sense of uh, senses, what anything that has beauty in it is beautiful by itself. It's not going to change its own qualities because I am looking at it or you are looking at it. It's beautiful regardless of who is looking at it. Allah created the, the, the seven samabat and he vazayyana sama bi masabiha and he beautified the sama of this dunya with masabe, with the stars and the, what we see, right? With, with, with lights that we think. He zayyana, he beautified the sama of this dunya. Now somebody looks up the sky and says, ah, it's not beautiful to me. This is just stars, this is just lights, it's nothing, it's so random, I get sick of looking. What is the issue here? The observer, not the object that is being looked. The object has inherent beauty in it, regardless of how we perceive it. Now, Raghi Malaswari says that uh, it's the, in many, many others also define beauty. Uh, they say, you know, in definitions, things are defined by their opposites. It's a general principle. What is the opposite of beauty? 
ugliness. Right? So there's many, many, if you go to the oldest lexicons, many would, would say uh, this is the antonym of ugliness. like uh, kal ilm, like knowledge and ignorance. They are opposites to each other. Knowledge. So when knowledge comes, ignorance goes away. They cannot cohabit in the same place at the same time. Darkness and light are opposite to each other. They cannot be at the same place at the same time. One comes, the other goes. The question that remains, how do we understand the relative aspect of beauty in a certain sense of beauty in the, in the eye of the beholder? This is a very famous proverb, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Is it true from our perspective? This, this pro proverb does not exist in Arabic. This is the construction, when you, when you search the orig origin of these uh, proverbs, uh, they are very instructive. They are very instructive because proverbs are at the level of civilizations. Proverbs are like they travel in the body of a civilization. They come into existence at a certain time in the unfolding of a civilization. Before that they haven't exist, existed and they remain at the deepest level. They remain at the deepest level of impacting cultures and individuals and human beings because this is very important to, for us to understand, to distinguish what we receive at the deepest level of our being. So, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Do, when, you, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Whenever you come across things like this, be very, very careful because this is, you know, like this, uh, new virus, new uh, COVID thing they invented, uh, vaccine. The level at which that vaccine operated was not like previous vaccines we had. It went way down into the human body. It operated at the genetic level. When we go to the genetic level, we have to be very careful because now we are dealing with transforming the very essence of our beings. So we, 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 we have genetically modified apples, for example, they come from, they, those, that tree is always going to give us genetically modified. We have transformed the very structure, inner structure of that being. So when we come across things like do as Romans do, when, when in Rome do as Romans do, when we come across uh, proverbs like uh, beauties in the eye of the beholder, we need to be very careful, we need to put our armor, we need to have our filters and say, wait a minute, I don't want to take this in because it's going to genetically modify me and I wouldn't even know this. This is so deep, this is how deep it is. So our scholars were so interested at that fundamental level of conceptual clarity that they said we have to define everything precisely. So we have books and books and books just for definitions. And when they said there are 10 principles which apply to every branch of knowledge, we have to put these, every branch of knowledge through these 10 filters. The first principle is al-had, definitions. What is the definition of this particular branch of knowledge? So, beauty uh, is beauty in the eye of the beholder. Who said that and do we take it from a Quranic perspective, from our own tradition? Do we accept it? What are we doing? 
we are making beauty relative. Our modern civilization is civilization of making everything relative. Your space, your space, my space is my space. There is nothing common that we share. And if we share, then I come with my own space and you come with your own space. It's all part of supper. It's all bringing your own perspective and we share it on the same table and everything goes because everybody has a voice. And this is the foundation of the Western civilization. We, we don't need to go into that, but one of the three sacred cows of the Western, modern Western civilization is the concept of personal freedom. It doesn't really, there is no freedom, like Eric Fromm, I think it's 1960s, he wrote this wonderful book called Escape from Freedom. Eric Fromm's book is fundamental, nobody talks about it right now, but it, you know, this concept of, of freedom in itself, that, oh, I have freedom, I can do whatever, nobody has freedom. Because we are all, uh, we are all constrained by our constitution. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us upon a fitra. He has created us within a frame, with a mold. No human being can go out of that mold. Ya mashal jinni, ulinsi, nishtatat man tanfudu min akhtari samawati walarti la tanfudu. Illa bisultat. So that, I think, is clear that there is an objective reality of beauty regardless of who looks at it. Beauty in itself exists as a quality. Like all qualities of like happiness, husn, grief, all qualities, we remember when we said uh, initially, uh, when we started, about everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is His creation. And we said creation is of two kinds, material and immaterial. So immaterial things are beauty, joy, happiness, uh, husn, grief, sabr, patience. Next, and I think this is the second last, we have to use the word uh, vocabulary of the Quran is what is Zina. We didn't do Zina uh, last time when we started with, in the, we had not done a Husn. Husn is so huge that we will inshallah come back to it when we go into the levels of beauty mentioned in the Quran. So beginning with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where we want to go today, uh, we will go to uh, beauty of the Quran, for example, beauty of the Prophet, beauty of this dunya, beauty of the hereafter, beauty of Jannah. Like these are all aspects of beauty mentioned in the Quran, and we will cover all of them, inshallah. And the words used, uh, this uh, zina, is 46 times in the Quran. The root has 46. So, Zuhina lil ladina kafirul hayat al dunya. Zuhina lil nasi hubu shahawati min al nisai wal banin. Kazalika zayyina li kulli ummatin amalahum, thumma ila rabbihim marjiyuhum. Look how many levels of beauty are, are mentioned in the Quran just using the derivatives of Zayanun. Zuhina is the intensive form. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he has kafaru, kafaru dunya. the life of this dunya, life of this world has been made beautiful for the disbelievers. So all of the Subhanallah, look at the uh, look at the levels using just one word, it's shaitan who has made their deeds beautiful to them. The power of shaitan to flip the deeds, the quality of the deeds. Beauty is a quality. Amal, our deeds can be beautiful or can be uh, the opposite of. So there are several levels of zayyan. 
of beads and what is zina we want if we could internalize we, we said something about husn already right we have some idea of the usage of husn in the quran if we could do that uh, for zina so zina Raghav again, SubhanAllah, Allah gave him such insight into concepts. If we, if we could get out of the, the vocabulary of the English language, because in English we just have the one word beauty, and we have like the the seven roots in the Quran that give so many levels of understanding of the concept of beauty that it becomes uh, impossible to translate them into into English because every time we say zina and we use it, the word beauty and we say husna and we use the word beauty again how are we going to make a distinction between the two because zina uh, He says the real, the real zina, the real beauty is that never tarnishes. Real beauty, everything else is, cannot be called beauty. Beauty has to be something that remains beauty whether we are in this dunya or in the hereafter. See the transference of the ideas. Then he says, a zina nafsi, something Something that beautifies the nafs. This is not part of the how you how we how we described initially. That something that it can be something that pleases us, but the nafs itself, our being, our whole being, can be beautiful, or it can be the opposite. And there are grades of beauty in the nafs itself. So, by definition. If we have an understanding of beauty of our whole being, which would be what we believe, what we do, what we acquire, what we give, like the amal, knowledge itself, beliefs can be beautiful, knowledge can be beautiful. Then the second aspect is the apparent beauty, which is in the form of of material aspect of uh, how we look. And the third this is beautiful because he says the beauty of the third aspect is actually outside our being but we acquire it by acquiring the beautiful thing. A beautiful house is not part of our being. But if we acquire a beautiful house, we become beautiful through that association with this acquisition of a beautiful house. <coughs> if, uh, likewise, other things. So, حَبَّبَ عَيْلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانَ وَزَّيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Allah SWT says that He has given you uh, the love of Iman. And he has made this beautiful to your hearts. So we have a concept of beauty that is outside our being in the form of Iman, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it uh, beautiful for us. <coughs> Lastly, I want to, before we go to the hadith of Jamal, Nadra. We, again, how do we, def how do we distinguish Tarifu fi yujuhim nadratan na'ima? How do we, wa lakahum nadratan masroora? How do we, how do we distinguish in translation the word nadra uh, from zina, from husn? If we are using the same word beauty for nadra, for husn and zina, we cannot. We have to add more descriptions. 
And the most important aspect of the usage of Nadra in the Quran is the freshness. Freshness, which is again an inadequate translation, but something when this uh, snow is almost gone now, you see this brownness in the grass, like it's so hard to look at. When this will come green, like the, for the first time, that's just fresh green, that's Nadra. It's the beauty that has freshness in it. And uh, is in Nadira, Ila Rabbiha Nazira. When the people of Jannah, may Allah SWT make us one of them, will look at the face of Allah SWT, the countenance of Allah SWT, there will appear in them a sense of beauty that will have this freshness. It will be all over again. It won't be the previous sense of beauty that they, they had. And this is mostly connected with mostly connected with the, uh, with the freshness. Now we come to the what we wanted to focus on today and again whenever we do these things we always go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, as the starting point and we said that uh, the beauty in the Quran has been mentioned in many aspects however uh, in terms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't have the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being beautiful in the Quran in the direct manner. So there is a distinction between the mention of something in the Quran as being beautiful, directly beautiful, and something that we infer from it. But the, the hadith in Sahih Muslim from an Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu anhu and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kala la yadukhlu al-jinnata man kana fi kalbihi mithkala zurratin min kibr Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu anhu says that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that uh, no one is going to enter Jannah who had mithkala zurra who had an iota an atom of pride in his heart Qala Rajul, a man said, a Rajul, yuhibbu an yakuna thawbahu hasana wa naalahu hasana. A man said, Ya Rasulullah, a man loves to have, have a, a beautiful clothing and beautiful shoes. Meaning, when you are, uh, you are wearing something, there is a sense of pride in it. The Prophet said, "Qala inna Allah jamilun yuhibbu al-jimal, al-kibru badal al-haqqi wa ghamt al-nas." The Prophet explained, "Inna Allah jamil, Allah is beautiful, yuhibbu al-jimal, and he loves beauty." Now we have this part of the hadith often quoted many times. Everyone knows, most people know this part of it. But this part of the hadith is in the context of kibr, in the context of what happens to the nafs of the one who is beautifying himself or herself. And we see this all the time. We see the corruption of the quality of acquiring beauty when that beauty makes one proud. The connection is so deep here that the Prophet ﷺ is talking about kibr. No one is going to enter Jannah. Uh, I think we need to just say, this is, say okay. The, yeah. No one is no one is going to enter Jannah who would have pride. Beauty can make people arrogant. And the Prophet ﷺ explains, no, this is not what I'm saying. There is no inherent connection between kibr 
and beauty because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful and he loves beauty. Ibn Qayyim rahmullah, he says that first of all this hadith needs to be reflected upon because uh, what does it mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful? Like how do we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful? Because remember when we started these classes, we started with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we said we have absolutely no access to his that, to his being because our be our, our, uh, our limitation is such that Laitha Kabisli is shay, he is unlike anything we can perceive. We cannot see him, we cannot imagine him, we cannot we we have no idea of the that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says that uh, Jamalahu subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah's Jamal, Allah's beauty as in this hadith has four aspects. The first is that of his that. Jamal and that. This is some this is one aspect of beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to which no one has a, has has any uh, access. No one has access to the that, the essence, the beauty of the essence. Number two, but Jamal Sifat. Look at the connection. He says the second aspect is the attributes and in the, in the sense of attributes, every attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is attribute of perfection. And we said one of the definitions, one of the aspects of beauty is perfection, kamal. I'm not saying this in the order, he's already actually the second is Vajimalul Asma, Fasmao, Uhu, Kulluha, Husna. So the third is Sifat, but uh, so beautiful names of Allah, we went through those in two or three classes, Al Asma al Husna. And we defined and characterized and distinguished between Ism and Sifa, the attribute and the name. The fourth, so Jamal al Jamal al Asma, and Jamal al Sifat. And the fourth is Jamal al Afal. The beauty of actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we can connect this concept of beauty with the concept that we dealt with when we are dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's presence or mention in the Quran. We said we have no access to his art. We have some access to his uh, sifat and to his names and we have more, the best, the most widest path that we have is in the form of his actions. And his actions were everything that, uh, that we see in terms of creation. So, khalaq samawati wal he created the heavens and the earth. Uh, he created life and death. So creation is an action of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Among many, many actions. Now what is the beauty of Allah's uh, what is the beauty of Allah's actions? He said, in terms of his that we don't know. In terms of uh, his uh, asma, we know a small husna he has given us. And in terms of his sifat, we said it's the perfection, beauty, perfection. His, his sifat, his attributes are all sifat al kamal, of perfection. In terms of jamal al al one, two, three, four. Actions become beautiful because of four attributes. Number one, hikmah, wisdom. His every action has wisdom in it. He doesn't do anything without wisdom. Number two, there is a purpose. 
in doing so. It's not batil, it's not for fun as we say. I'm just doing it for fun. <laughs> there is no such thing as doing something for fun. Number three, justice, adl. And number four is mercy, rahma. Actions become beautiful through these four attributes. So if our actions have these four attributes, number one, there is wisdom. We, do, we don't do something just without hikmah. Number two, we do them with purpose. We came here to pray, we came here for this class, we do every single act that we do with a purpose. Number three, justice. This concept of justice is so important for us to understand in the, in, in the context of beauty. Because what do we understand about justice is not really the totality of, totality of it, because just when we talk about justice, we normally think of the, the court system. We normally think of being just. We normally think justice, other, in fact, is to have things in their proper places. It's so fundamental. To have things in their proper places. What do we mean by that? We mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything in relation to another thing. So, for example, we have the rahm, the womb of the mother. The womb of the mother is a space occupied by a baby. Every child that occupies that space in the lifetime of a mother becomes connected through Silatul Rahm. This is the connection of the womb. And nobody can cut that off because we don't choose which Rahm we are going to occupy. We spend so much time there in the womb of the mother. Another person comes two years later and spends the same amount of time there more or less. Now we are connected because we had occupied the same space, which means we received nourishment we received our genetic code, we received our emotional makeup, we received our psyche, we received so much from that place that we are now inseparably connected with our brothers and sisters forever and ever and ever. And we come to a place in our life and say, ah, I have nothing to do with you anymore. Khalas. We can say that with our mouth, but this is not adl, this is not justice. Because we have now removed the natural place that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made through Adl by doing what is the opposite of Adl? Zulm. That's why Zulm is opposite of beauty. Zulm is ugly among, among, among other things. And then lastly is the Rahma, is the mercy. So he says that uh, this hadith, in Allah Jameel, when you have good Jamal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful and He loves beauty. He says, it has many, many aspects, but there are two foundational, exalted aspects of this. And the first one is Marifa. First one is the knowledge, the, gnos the gnosis, the inner, 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 uh, inner knowledge. فَيَعْرِفُ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ تَعَلَى بِالْجِمَالِ جِمَالِ الَّذِي لَا يَمَاثِلُهُ فِيهِ شَيْءِ We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the beauty He has is unlike the beauty of anything. Unlike. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءِ Then part of the ayah لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءِ means his essence. There is nothing that is comparable to him in essence, but there is nothing comparable to him in terms of his beauty as well. So we have two aspects. And the second, Wahiru Saluk. 
and this has several aspects. Saluk is Salaka. Uh, this is the path. Remember what Imam Ghazali, when we started these classes, we said, how do you define the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The three foundations. He said that the book, uh, everything in the Quran, first of all, this is the invitation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to all humanity. So it is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. Tarif madu. It is the definition is that. Second, he said it's risala. Risala is the, the path. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls human beings to come to him. And then he says, this is the path to come to me. The path that we know is revealed to us. We don't make it. And this is also one of the fundamental differences that we have in the modern Western civilization. We don't know, we don't, humankind as in totality does not have the ability to create its own road map. We have to have a map given to us. And that is the function of the messengers and the prophets. They came and they said, this is how you travel. You pray five times and you, this is halal and this is haram and this is, uh, this is what you do and this is what you, what you don't do. We don't, we cannot construct those. Like if we were to spend, if the totality of humankind spent all the time on eternity and find and say, well, are there four salahs or five? Ten or twenty? Never. We are never. How much uh, month of fasting, Ramadan, one month, one week? Like, how are we going to know these things? What is the most beneficial to us? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. What is truth? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So he tells us through the agency of, and the last part he said is, the mark. So what's going to happen to us after we finish our journey here? So sluk, is the second of those two great foundational aspects of, uh, of this hadith. The first one is that this is some idea, this gives us some idea of the marifa, of the Gnosis understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it's a negative, it's a negative definition. La ilaha illallah is, in, is a negative, it's a negation. We are negativity. We define Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by eliminating everything. La ilaha illallah. There is none worthy of worship. Right? We don't have a positive definition. Because positive definition necessarily leads to multiplicity. You have to just eliminate everything. And then there, you are just left with one. Right? The second is the sluk. Is the sluk. Yabdu bin jimali allazi yuhibbuhu na'mat. Number one is the heart. So, sluk, just very clearly, two main foundational aspects of the hadith. One, we say, is inaccessible to us. Marifa, we have, we have knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala built into our beings. Everyone has that. And the more we uh, more we acquire it, uh, more we have experiential reality of the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our lives, more uh, we know about him in a very private way. Every one of us, every human being has a very, very secret private relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even those who do not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have a relationship because they say, we don't believe in you. Those who don't, they, that means they still have a relationship, they are just negating it. When they say, nobody can say. So we have a private, very, very secret relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why what happens to the innermost beings, innermost recesses of our being, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Remember the ayah that he's closer to us, Hablul Barid. 
we, we don't know what Hamlu Breed is actually, we just translate it as the Jagurur Veer. Uh, there is an article in the first volume of my EQ about this, uh, this, this one. But it is something extremely close to us and the, it changes names as it travels in the body. Regardless, uh, that secret relationship, and this is, I mentioned this uh, in passing one time, but I want to repeat it. The reality, the inner reality of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is known to none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not even known to us completely. We have intimations, we have some understanding of where do we stand with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reality of that inner sir, the secret of this relationship will be revealed to us on the day when everything will become transparent to us. It is on that day that we will really see where we stand in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can imagine things now in this dunya, we can think of whatever we want to think of, but that really, the, the point I wanted to make was in relation to the Prophet we love our Prophet we want to just be there, we want to be in his company, we want to share everything the space that he shared. We want to go to Medina all the time. We want to be in his presence in the hereafter. But do we know him? Like we know our brothers and sisters. And do we ever, ever have a personal relationship with the Prophet? It's one of the barriers that we have created ourselves because of many reasons. I don't want to go into those details, but. Can we think of the Prophet as a baby who was born like all babies are born, who was held by his mother like all babies are held? Do we know who was Baraka, Umayyam? Do we have any relationship with these people? Like when we want to know somebody, when, when we want to know each other, how do we know each other? It's by knowing who you are, where were you born, who are your relatives, who are your parents, what do you do? Like, this is how we know each other. We want to know the Prophet in the real sense, meaning, do we have that access to him? We have access to him because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved his life for us. From the time he came to this dunya, even before that, the noor that his mother had in the womb, of which we know, the radiance that came, the noor that came, she felt it. He wasn't, like, he wasn't even born. So, I think it's very important for us to develop a personal relationship with the Prophet knowing that within that relationship there are zones to which we have no access. When we recite with Doha, when Layli is a Sajama, when Daka of Buka Mamakala, when Al Akhira to Hadullah to Nakula. Alam Yajitka Yatiman, Baava, Provider the Kador and Bahada. What does it mean? What does Alam Nashra mean? These are the realities of his blessed life known only to him. But we do have access to the outward and to some extent some of the inner connections that we can make with, with our Prophet I want to finish just this part uh, of the saluk of our journey uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first is the qalb and within that is the ikhlas and love and Inaba and Tawakkal, four aspects of the reality of the Qalb, inner path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and these are all parts of beauty. We become beautiful if we have ikhlas, which is impossible to translate. We translate it as sincerity, but sincerity is so flat. Well, muhabba, love. Al-Inaba Tawakkal. These are the four attributes of the heart uh, 
and then the beauty of the tongue, the beauty of what comes out from our mouth, the beauty of amal, the salah, the siyam, the sidq, and then the beauty of the limbs. Look at this concept of beauty that our limbs are in a state of beauty when they have, uh, when they are obedient to the Creator's purpose of creating. When the feet travel to the one of the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they become beautiful. When we do sajda, when we have hilm, when we have we are using our, when we are making wudu, he says, yani every act of the, of the, of, 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 of our jawari, every act of our limbs is beautified in relationship to the extent to which it conforms to the purpose of his creation. So the beauty, as we said, is kamal. And this perfection, and that's why in this, uh, this Jibrail we have the, Asan, as if we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In totality, the beauty of the body is, and this is where the hadith is very clearly stating in reference to the question that was that was asked. Bi zahari ni'mati alayhi fi libasihi in the clothing. It is the manifestation the beauty, beauty of, the, of the body is in the manifestation of what we wear. Again, disconnecting from kibr, that was the foundational aspect of the, of the hadith. Why tahara is beautiful? When we are in a state of wudu, do we feel the difference inside? There is a difference in our being when we know that we are in the state of tahara, there is a sense of, of beauty in it. So, inshallah, uh, we will continue with this when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Bani Adam, Ya Bani Adama, Kad anzalna alaykum libasan, biwari sawatikum parisham wa libasu taqwa zalika khair, zalika min ayatillahi la'allahum, we have a, uh, we have the libas, the outward libas, but libas taqwa, the libas of taqwa, libas of taqwa, libas is what we wear, and if we wear taqwa, zalika khair. So to conclude, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clarified the beauty of the body with libas. He has connected the beauty of the qalb with taqwa and he has clarified zina the zahir wal batin, the beauty of the outward and the inward and he has clarified the excellence or the perfection of the zahir and the batin. <coughs> Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has granted us this beautiful afternoon to reflect on his book. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq and ability to continue to, to do this, internalize the message that he has given to us and uh, meet him in a state of beauty, inshallah. Are there any questions?
Köszönöm. It's the, so the question here is about the, if this is Jibreel and the Iman, Islam and Ihsan and Ihsan was defined uh, as if uh, you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if you cannot then uh, know that he sees you and uh, so the question being raised is that because we started the course by saying we have no comprehension of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond our anybody's comprehension. So what does it mean? The second is actually a semantic uh, question related to the semantics of seeing. And again, that I think that's easier to, to clarify because the limitations of the English language uh, or any language for that matter. Uh, so it's not the physical sight that we are talking so that's that's easy to, to clear. Just not nobody understands the hadith in the sense of uh, sight with the eyes. But because of the limitations of the language, it's very interesting because uh, when they again definitions, when they defined who is a sahabi, who is a companion of the Prophet So one of the initial definitions was the one who saw him and believed in him. And then they said, oh, wait a minute. Abdullah bin Mutum, like, if somebody is blind, how would they see it? So I said, no, no, we don't mean see with your eye. We see, we, we use the word see, not as basara, but the one who perceived his presence. The one who was conscious that there is this messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we use the word see, S-C-E, S-E-E, -E, we are limited with our, the vocabulary, but idrak is perhaps, uh, daraka is perhaps a better, perception is perhaps a better translation of that. Or basira. Or basira is perhaps, basar, mashallah. Yes, basira is in the heart. So it's the uh, basar is just what we see. And by the way, if we reflect on, on uh, even the physical aspect of it, we normally say that we see with our eyes. We don't see with our eyes. Eyes, even physically, are the, the lens, the outermost aspect of seeing. When I had my retina detached, I learned this. There are millions of neurons in a jelly behind the retina. So this lens, and they can replace this lens. Most of us, I have, my lens is gone. I have a plastic lens. Just to see, that's cataract. When they put the plastic lens, it does the more or less the same thing. So this lens that the camera, this cell phone has or the camera has, this is the, the apparent mechanism of seeing. Of course, if we don't have the lens, we won't be able to see it. But the actual sight happens in the mind through these millions of uh, neurons which travel in this jelly. So when, when I see you, for instance, or I see you or see an object, the lens is just giving me the physical dimensions and immediately these neurons start to travel and they tell me that I am seeing Haider, who has these features because my memory says, oh, you are introduced to him as Heather because you are a human being. When I see you, and I see you, I, my eyes, my lens doesn't tell me this is who. My my lens doesn't tell me that this is not a chair but a human being. So this seeing aspect, this is just the footnote. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, what does it, what does the hadith mean? That was your question. When we, when, 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 when the, in the, this particular hadith of Ihsan, you see Allah means that your whole being is conscious of what's going to happen to you. 
with the commandments of Allah, with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he has made. So the state of khushu, the state of being in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the state of being the state of being uh, being in the uh, the state of being in a in a consciousness again consciousness is not the right word but you know what it, what the hadith leads to is the active experiential reality of being in relationship with the creator and we are the true ibad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that state. That is what is meant, meant by it. It's more like awareness. Awareness not in the sense of modern understanding no, of uh, you but you hazirullah nafsi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns you of his nafs, he says in the Quran. Although we have no idea of his nafs. So it's that kind of. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay. Inshallah, we stop here. We continue. This theme is so beautiful. Just to talk about beauty is beautiful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the, the ability to beautify ourselves, our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our homes, our places of worship, our place, places of residence. and. Uh, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that very special relationship with the Prophet I think if we could just make for the rest of this Ramadan this one aspect, I wanted to mention it at the beginning of Ramadan but we didn't have the class last time. The beauty of the Prophet as, men as mentioned, the outward beauty mentioned in the Shemail, like his adat, his, uh, uh, his presence but the beauty of his being in our hearts. So if we could think of his blessed life as a real life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved it for a reason. Like we, what do we know about other prophets? What do we know about even Isa al Islam who's only 571 years before him? Do we have any access to any prophet's life other than what's mentioned in the Quran in the real sense? And even then, like they said, what kind of messenger is it who walks in the, in the bazaars and who eats? This is the kind of messenger that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to send at the end of all the messengers so that he can be a human being for us. So if we internalize this, inshallah, it will be very beneficial. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi l'akhira fi hasana wa qina azaba al-nar. Ya Allah, anta halimun kareemun azimun tuhibul afwafwafwanna ya kareem. ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين يا الله أنت حليم كريم عظيم تحب العفو فاعفو لنا يا كريم رب اغفر وارحم أنت خير الراحمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه برحمتك يا رحمة الراحمين سلام عليكم